My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today I'm speaking with Mark Hirschberg, who is the author of The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. Mark was educated at MIT, ultimately receiving a master's in cryptography. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes, you did. All right. And uh, you've spent your career launching and fixing new ventures at startups, Fortune 500s, and academia. He has developed new software languages, online marketplaces, new authentication systems. And one of the things that I really want to touch on, because this is really intriguing to me, is the fact that you tracked criminals and terrorists on the dark web. Um, also, Mark helped create the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, which is MIT's Career Success Accelerator, where he's taught for 20 years. Uh, Mark also serves on the boards of nonprofits, the, uh, let's see, Techie Youth, and Plants a Million Corals. So I just want to say thank you, Mark, for agreeing to come on the show and, and agreeing to speak with me. I think that we're going to have a great conversation, and uh, um, I've just been looking forward to, to speaking with you, so thank you. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I've been looking forward to it. So I'd like to kick things off with, well, first, prior to starting record, uh, we talked a little bit about Manhattan. You're, you're based out of Midtown Manhattan. Um, where were you born and raised? I was born in New York City, grew up briefly in Westchester, just north of the city. And I really think of most of my childhood, half of it on the North Shore of Chicago, and half of it in central New Jersey. So suburbs in large metropolitan areas. From Westchester, your, your family migrated to uh, Chicago, the North Shore of Chicago. And was that, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, employment, your parents moved you guys there, or I'm sorry, I don't even know if you have siblings, so. <laughs> I, I do have a younger brother. The reason we moved, my father was a physician and he got into hospital administration very early. He quickly became chief of medicine. Now, even though moving around a lot wasn't perceived as being very common for our parents' generation, my dad was very good at being proactive in his career, looking for opportunities, looking for things that would work or advance his career, not necessarily change the title because his title was typically the same, but new challenges, new opportunities, growth. And so he found an opportunity out in Chicago that brought him out there. And of course, all of us went with him and later on found one that took us back to the East Coast. I'd like to dig in a little bit about some of your early influences, what really led you on the path that you're on now. Uh, you went to MIT, you got your undergrad and your graduate degree from there. And, and you teach there. What, yeah, I'm, I have a lifer. <laughs> so, so what led you to MIT? Uh, you know, your dad being in medicine, and you kind of went the the techie route. What were some of your influences there? Very early on, I loved math and science. That was in the nature versus nurture. There was just some nature in me of I love math and science. I was always interested in it. I grew up as a competitive chess player. I was a classic 1980s nerd. So just all the things that you would, would assume with that. And it led me onto a path winding up at MIT from that kind of background. Isn't that, that surprising? My parents were wonderful in terms of nurturing. 
that love of math and science in me. My dad, of course, having a science background in medicine, my mother was a teacher, so really fostering education, both of them encouraging all types of learning. I remember when we were in New Jersey, we lived near Princeton University and at the Princeton Plasma Physics Labs, they used to have a Saturday morning lecture series. And every Saturday morning, my dad would drive me over there and we'd listen to a different science lecture. Now that I'm, I'm an adult, I appreciate how much I like to sleep in on Saturday morning. So I really understand and appreciate and I'm thankful for my dad giving up sleeping in on Saturday morning to take me to a science lecture. I, I want to dig into the the leadership aspect because I, I realize that that you've done a lot of product development or you know uh, program development and you've taken on a, a leadership role in a lot of these projects and you've got to have a good sound understanding of leadership and ethics to really be at the level that you're at. And, and then on top of that, you've written this book to, to help people. And I, I always relate uh, leadership with, you know, you're, you're adding as much value to yourself so that you can add value to those that you lead. And that really is the measure of a, a leader's success is the success of the people they're leading. So um, with with that in mind, I, I'd like to touch on your book and I'd like to touch on your leadership philosophy. But before we dig into that, because I think that's going to be a, a bulk of our conversation, I really want to find out a little bit about the, uh, the chasing the bad guys on the dark web. How, how did you get into that? It seems kind of far afield at first blush, but in fact, it's not so surprising given what I do. My graduate work at MIT, as you noted, was in cryptography. Cryptography is a branch of mathematics and computer science that really focuses on cybersecurity. Cryptography is what creates all those algorithms to encrypt your data, to protect it. It's why you can enter your credit card online and not worry about someone stealing it. So that's what we do. We create all these new techniques. Now, most of what we do is either create new algorithms or we implement tools. How do we secure your data? How do we protect your data? Things like alternatives to passwords. We come up with new things because everyone hates passwords. They're a big pain. So how can we come up with new technologies? I worked on that and I have some patents in that area. But in this particular company that I got involved with, they were doing intelligence gathering. So the way to think of it, we know there are bad guys out there terrorists, cyber criminals, and they're not fools. They're using the internet just like we are. They are coordinating with each other. They are selling services and products to each other. And boy, if we could just know what they're doing, wouldn't that be helpful? Just like we have the informants, the undercover agents who infiltrate the mafia or terrorist cells. But we were trying, trying to do that, but online. Now, the good news is we weren't there in person, so there wasn't a lot of physical threat to us. It's not to the level I really respect the people who literally put themselves out there. But we had to go online and convince them, hi, I'm a terrorist too, or I'm a cyber criminal too. Let me into your clubhouse. Yeah, I'll talk about whatever bad things we're doing. Meanwhile, we're of course gathering that information. And then as we acquire it, we put into various data systems and we would sell that data to our corporate clients as well as various government agencies. Overall, what's, what's the main message of your book? It's that we traditionally focus on our core competency. It might be software development in my case. It might be accounting or marketing or sales. We think, well, this is what I do. But in fact, there are all these other skills, leadership, networking, negotiating, communicating, team building, these other skills that are so fundamentally important and we've heard about them. No one here has said, oh, I've never heard networking before. What does that mean? But no one's actually taught them to us. And by focusing on these skills, even getting just slightly better in them, we can massively improve our effectiveness and success. What inspired you to write this book? 
Yeah, good question. Because you wouldn't normally think that nerdy STEM guy would be writing <laughs> a book on these skills. Early in my career, I recognized that I wanted to be a CTO, a chief technology officer, the person in charge of all the software developers. And as I began to understand what does that mean, I realized it wasn't just about being a good engineer. There were other things I had to do, like leadership and communication and negotiating. And I didn't have those skills, so I began to develop them in myself. And as I was doing so, I realized they're not just for the senior people. They are for everyone, down to the most junior person. They're for entrepreneurs and solopreneurs as well. Everyone benefits. So I began to train up my team in these skills. I didn't just want me to be the only one to have them. As I was doing this, MIT had been surveying companies who come and hire our students and saying, tell us about the things that you look for so we can stay competitive. And what they saw was companies were saying, these are the same skills we want, not just in your students. In everyone we hire, we want these skills, but we can't find them. And similar surveys have been done by other schools. So there are all these key skills no one is teaching. At MIT, they started what's now referred to as the Career Success Accelerator. And when I heard about that, I said, you know, I've been teaching this stuff to my employees. I'm happy to share my material with you, whatever I can do to help get this going. So they asked me to come help them out. And then said, you know, you've got some great content here and why don't you come help us teach? So with no real intention, I wound up putting together this program at MIT, helping out, not me alone, and then teaching there for the past 20 years. And so I've been doing this understanding not just what these skills are. Again, I didn't just make this up off the top of my head. This comes from surveying companies out there, but learning what's the most effective way to teach it. When I tell people this, I know what are the next three questions we're going to get because I've been doing it for so long. But I also know it applies to more than MIT students. And so I want to get out to a wider audience. And that's what the book and the app allows me to do. Yeah, I was checking out your app earlier. Uh, I was scrolling through some of the, the ethics statements and just really well put together. It's easy to use, an easy to use app. And I'll have all the links in the show notes so that people can can go and download the app. I, I think it's pretty useful. I, and I would imagine it it uh, is even more useful in combination with your book. Yeah, and you know, the reason I did the app when you read a book on leadership or on these other skills, or even a kind of general self-help book, you say, okay, well, this is real useful. There are some great tips, but then you forget three weeks later, you're reading another book, you get busy of other things. And our job as authors, it's not simply to get people to buy some paper from us. It's to help transform people. So I want them to retain that content and using my background in media and education, I thought about what is necessary. I actually didn't intend to write the app. I really thought someone must have created this and I'll just go license it, but no one had. So we filed a patent around it and created the app. And the way it works is as long as you open it at least once a month, so we know that you're active, the rest of the time you don't have to open it. It's a free app you download from the Android and iPhone store. You don't have to open it every day. It's just gonna pop up one of the tips at a time you set. So maybe as you're going into the office in the morning, you get that little tip and that reminder, all oh, right, here's a good tip on leadership. Here's a reminder about networking and it helps keep it top of mind. Or maybe you're about to say, walk into a networking event. Say, oh, okay, well, boy, I haven't read Mark's book in six months. I'm gonna open the app and quickly go through what were those networking tips, get that refresher. You can of course download it, even if you don't have the book. And if that's helpful to you, I am happy for you and happy to let you get the free app with that. But if you've read the book and you have all the content and know the stories, this helps to remind you and keep it top of mind. And later this year, we're going to be putting out a general version so other authors can also have their books be used in this way where their readers can get that daily reminder of the content to help retain it. One of the things that you said earlier from your childhood is that you, you were um, kind of a, a, a chess guy. So clearly strategy is appealing to you, which, you know, a lot of, it, it, it's interesting to me because a lot of my friends that are techies, they also are really big on chess, but it doesn't seem like they go together. 
it, it, do you understand? It doesn't seem like something that a uh, uh, science and technology engineering person would would you know consider as a pastime. But um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on that. What is the connection? Sure, and it certainly is common that people in math and science tend to be into chess. I think one of the reasons is because there is a logic or procedure to it. Consider, for example, for playing poker. They always say in poker, you don't play the cards, you play the math. So if we're playing poker, I have to read you, I have to figure out, are you bluffing? I have to know when I should bluff against you. There's a lot of emotion in that. Not that we necessarily get emotional, but it's not, it's not just, oh, the probability of drawing this card is X. There's a lot more to it. That's what traditionally we don't, those of us very into, into STEM skills, we don't really focus on that side of our development as strongly as we do that logic and procedural side. Now, chess, on the other hand, well, there are rules. You can only move the piece in this way. And whereas in, let's say, a sport in football, yes, there are rules about when you can throw the ball and how, but you can kind of go anywhere on the field, right? When you're the running back, where do you want to run to? It's open. But in chess, that bishop only moves this way, not any way, just a certain way. So there are a lot of rules and constraints. In theory, if you could think far enough ahead, if you had enough computational power, chess is a solvable problem. Like there's, there's no way to kind of lose because you can say, here's the optimal way to do it. In fact, checkers is already a solved game. A computer will never lose at checkers if you turn it up all the way. Eventually, we'll do the same thing with chess. And so we like the fact that it's just like a mathematical formula to us. It's a really complicated one that no human can possibly solve. But we, we follow that same process for how we play chess. On the strategy side of things, I, I'm curious, are you familiar with the grand strategy program at Yale? I don't think I am. What's in that program? So it's from my understanding of it, it's, uh, well, it was four professors got together. They're realizing that this Ivy League school is turning out um, people, you know, graduates that are going to be leaders, whether it's in business or uh, government, they're, they're going to be in leadership roles, yet they don't really have the skills to lead and think critically big picture wise. So they start teaching or they started this program where they're teaching um, the art of war or they're studying the art of war, the, the history of the Peloponnesian War. They're reading The Prince by Machiavelli and all these, these older texts that really you can analyze the the successes and the blunders of you know world leaders throughout history and not necessarily that those same situations will arise but the the critical thinking that goes into long game strategy is really it, it takes a lot of critical thinking and and not only that, but being able to, I guess those interpersonal skills by, you know, it's almost a blend of chess and poker where you're able to read the person that either you're in competition with or you're aligned with. And so there's, there's that component of uh, I guess the empathetic side of leadership, and and so in in the background you can see the the title of my book, the the Grand Strategy Program at Yale was a big influence on this this book that I wrote. That eventually, well, it's gonna it's uh, release is set for October of this year, so. Um, I'm trying Congratulations. to hype it right now, but uh, 
We should uh, definitely, but we'll talk more after the show about how to do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was a, a, a big influence on really, really taking who you are as a person and looking at who you want to be and looking at the long game. And it's not necessary, necessarily your your career path because eventually you'll retire or you may shift fields and but ultimately your purpose in life is is tied to really the inner you and not necessarily the the path that you're on right now because if things shift if you shift careers or Maybe you move or whatever it is, maybe health issues, you, you can't do the same things that you used to do, but it doesn't change your purpose in life. It's just how you, um, I guess, how you accomplish or demonstrate your purpose and values uh, is really kind of. You know, it surprises a lot of people to learn that at MIT, one quarter of the classes we take are humanities classes. MIT actually requires more humanities classes than any other university out there. And the reason we do that is because we are producing scientists and engineers who are going to be leading organizations, who are going to be leading our development into the future. And it's important that not only do they understand how do you actually build a new tool, but understand the implication of the tool that you're building, whether it's an implication for how it can't be used for good or evil, or even the implication that this particular tool might advantage or disadvantage certain groups. There's a lot of ethics and morality and societal implication in what scientists and engineers do. And MIT takes a very strong view that you have to understand the context in which your work is developed. So I, I really like this idea of a grand plan that you can't just say, well, here are the tools to be effective. You have to understand the context in which you work so you can make sure what you're being effective at is good. I'm going to just use good in a general sense for the organization, for other people, for society. What I believe you just said is really teaching those students to take an ethical approach to, you know, when they're influencing organizations or the development of uh, X, Y, Z, whatever, what have you. But I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what ethics means to you. Yeah. Ethics, when I was doing the book, I very much want to make sure I had a chapter on ethics. And I am really surprised and disappointed that in so many business books I have read on running a business, on how to be an effective manager and how to be a good leader on all sorts of skills, ethics is not addressed. You probably won't even find the word in many of the books out there. We don't think about it. It's an afterthought. And that's unfortunate. I think that's why we face some of the challenges that we have today that people do say, oh yeah, I guess, yeah, women should be equal, we shouldn't harass them, sure, I get that. But well, okay, it's saying you get that and what the reality is that women are facing, we're a far cry from where we should be. And maybe if we had really emphasized it, we'd be in a better place that people would grow up understanding the ethical implications. Now, that's an easy one to say, sexual harassment, bad. And those ethic cases, okay, there's black and white. Don't steal from the company. Don't sexually harass someone. You don't need a lot of training on that. We all get. There are just some people perhaps who don't get, but you kind of either get or you don't. And the ones who don't, they know where the line is. They're just choosing to ignore it. It gets a little more subtle when we get to other circumstances. So a lot have grayer areas or where it's not so clear what's the right thing to do. For example, let's look at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the bank, of course, had a CEO who said, I want to see us grow the number of accounts we have and put this metric out there. And I don't think the CEO was saying, hey, everyone, do whatever it takes and be unethical. But the CEO set a certain standard, set these very difficult objectives. 
what wound up happening somewhere down the line, some manager basically said, do what you got to do. And what we found a few years ago was that the, the people on the line, the people calling customers, I'd say, oh, hey, listen, we've got these other products. Oh, you're not interested? Oh, okay, that's too bad. As soon as you hang up the phone, they added those products to your portfolio. They signed you up for accounts you didn't need. Say, hey, look, I just signed this guy up for two more accounts. Give me my bonus. Give me my promotion. I've met my quota. Because the system design put this pressure on them. And so one thing we have to look at is when we create pressures, when we create incentives, carrots and sticks, do they align to do the right thing? We see on the internet, we of course know, well, the carrot is clicks, views, likes. Oh, if the way to do that is to make people angry, if the way to do that is, for example, to make teen girls upset with their body, as we've seen on Instagram, but hey, who cares if those girls are getting upset? Who cares if they have body issues? Look at our engagement numbers. And isn't that what matters? Because I get measured on engagement, not on whether teen girls really have a healthy body image. And so we see these incentive systems. It's not that someone's saying, hey, I want to be bad to these girls or these customers, but the incentive systems, the positives versus the negatives don't align and they lead to some of these more subtle behaviors. The other thing that we sometimes see is when we get to models that have secondary implications that are really hard to understand. So we see this a lot in AI. There's a great book by a woman named Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction. And it's how data models and AI and machine learning can lead to some bad outcomes. So here's a simple example. There was a practice back mid-century called redlining. And this is back when people would go for loans. When discrimination was unfortunately more rampant, the banks would draw a red line around a neighborhood. And if the color of your skin wasn't appropriate for the neighborhood where you were trying to get a loan, sorry, you didn't qualify. Now, thanks to the movements in the 60s, we've put these redlining regulations in. We're stopping that. And banks, I believe, are generally speaking good about they will lend money to anyone who's worthy. I don't think any bank is actively saying, ooh, let's, let's make decisions based on the color of people's skin. What banks are doing is they're using algorithms. I remember when we would move, my dad would go into the bank and my brother and I would be bored for what seemed like hours on end as my dad went through the loan process and I had to convince them, no, you can trust me, give me money. But now it's done online. You fill out the application, you've got your credit score, you've got your, your credit history, your tax returns. They can use all this to measure you. Okay, that's great. And the great thing is they're not looking at the color of your skin. They don't ask, by the way, what's your race on these applications? Unfortunately, they do ask for your address. They look at your zip code. And it turns out if you live in this neighborhood, they tend to be more affluent and better than people in that neighborhood. Well, for historical reasons, because certain racist banks were preventing certain races from moving to certain neighborhoods, the zip code you live in correlates a lot to race. And so the algorithms used today to do this automated credit check, to do this automated, do you qualify for this car loan, for this, uh, this housing loan, it's using data that historically has had some racism built into it. I don't think the banks, in fact, I'm sure the banks are not trying to be racist. In fact, in the AI community, we're having big discussions about how do we undo this? How do we, how do we stop this? But we have to use data to train our systems and the only data we have has some bias in it. And then you get to interesting questions like, well, what if I'm gonna make up some numbers? This is certainly not the, the real numbers, but just to give an example, what if three out of every thousand people effectively get discriminated against, not intentionally, but the way the algorithm works, they just get disqualified for a loan. But the other 997 people, not only do they qualify, thanks to these algorithms, they're so efficient, they get a lower price. They get a better rate than if we had humans doing it. Well, that better rate means these families can afford a better home, move to a better neighborhood. It means food on the table, maybe first time home ownership that they couldn't do. So is it a reasonable trade-off that on the whole, we're better, 997 people now get access to home ownership, but three of them get discriminated against? Is that fair? I don't have an easy answer to this, but these are some of the subtleties that we're looking at. No one is intentionally being unethical, 
but there are ethical implications to a lot of the things that we do these days. I'm wondering if you could sum up what you just said for the everyday listener, what ethics is, because really it sounds like it's managing the gray areas with the intent to do the most good for the most amount of people and, you know, try and eliminate the, the negative effect of whatever action it is that you're taking, um, you know, limit that. So kind of attempting to do no harm and benefit the most, you know, good for the most, I, I guess. Well, so that's an interesting question itself. And this gets really into the fundamentals of philosophy. There's what's known as utilitarian ethics, which is the most good, right? The greater good and one person gets hurt, but two people get saved on the net, that's better. So you can look from a utilitarian standpoint, was the most good. You can argue on the other hand, that if for example, one person gets lynched, even if a million people have some positive improvement, say, wait a second, just the very act of doing something so heinous. We're not talking about one person losing money and others gaining money. We're talking about something that just violates social norms. Maybe, maybe that's not the right metric. There's something known as virtue ethics. And so you're not just looking at on balance, the net good. You're looking at really what the values are and where the lines are. And so there's different schools of thought on ethics and what's right. And that's one of the reasons it's so challenging. And this even goes back to one of the reasons engineers like chess, there's one set of rules for chess, but there isn't one set of rules for ethics. In fact, when you look at political differences, I don't want to take us down politics. It's not that either side is evil. No one's saying, how do we really screw the other side? But their view of what we should do with our resources, how it should be distributed for the greater good, whether that goes into national defense, whether that goes into social safety nets, whether we should do certain programs or other programs or do it certain ways, that's all about how people see different roads to doing good. And that's what makes the world complicated. But here's something to keep in mind with ethics. I think you'll appreciate it because it comes from a, a firefighting background. As little kids, we were all trained with fire drills. Back in school, teacher says, we're going to do a fire drill. You're going to hear the alarm. We're going to line up. We're going to walk slowly. We're not going to push. We know not to use the elevators. And I've been in fire drills. I've been in buildings where the fire alarm has gone off unexpectedly. I have not seen people push and shove. I have seen people walk calmly to the stairs and exit the building. We've all been trained how to do it. If we hadn't, if you didn't hear a fire alarm before, and someone shouts, there's a fire, we're all going to die. What happens? You get people pushing and shoving. But we've been trained not to panic. When it comes to ethical issues, not the, the obvious ones like don't steal the money, don't sexually harass your coworker, but the more subtle ethical issues, we've had no training. And so usually these issues come up when there's some type of pressure, when there's some decision. It might not be a split second decision, but it might be you know what, in two days, we're going to have trouble making payroll. What do we do, right? The clock is ticking. We have to make a decision. You're feeling the pressure. And if you've had no training, you're likely to panic. You're likely to just shove people out of the way. You're likely to race to whatever seems right in the moment. But if you've had training, you've said, okay, we've talked about, we know where the guardrails are. We know not to take the elevator in these circumstances. If you've practiced, if you've trained, if you've drilled, you're not going to let the pressure sway you. You're not going to panic. And so to get better at ethics, we need to do fire drills. We need to talk through ethical case studies and have conversations and talk about where are the lines when we're not feeling that pressure. So when we are in that situation, we know here are the guidelines, here are the lines not to cross. So just what we've done with fire drills, we should do with ethics. And is that part of the, the program that you, you teach at MIT? We unfortunately don't get much into ethics at MIT. 
some of what we do, the, the way we teach at MIT, we do a lot of role-playing case studies. It's not just we're going to lecture at you. It's interactive. And so some of them do involve situations that could lead to life or death. And it's important that they talk about, hey, we're putting someone's life at risk. What's the balance? Not just a person. We put firefighters' lives at risk. We say, we want you to go into that fire. Now, firefighters, we've given them training. Of course, you know what you're getting into when you're joining. You're not surprised you're going into a fire. So what's the balance to say? Is it reasonable to send in the firefighter? I'm sure there are times where they say, no, I, we know someone's about to die in there, but it is too risky. We can't send in the fire team. So we have rules for that. And we've thought about what is the balance. So those are questions that we touch on a little, not as much as I'd like at MIT, but in fairness, we're covering so many topics in a short period of time, any one of which could be a full semester class. So we only get to touch upon them a little. And, and that program that you teach in, is that is that just one single course over a semester? It's a year-long program broken up into different sections. So in the fall, we have a couple different workshops. During our January session, we have some intensive weeks of full-time training, then more workshops and programs in the spring. And then they do an internship over the summer and have some reflective work while they're in the internship to really apply and understand what they've learned, how that works in the real world. That sounds uh, um, like very, very similar to the grand strategy program at Yale. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm sure that there's some big differences, but all in all, you're preparing the, the students to be leaders. and, and I guess, effective influencers with, you know, an ethical viewpoint. Is that kind of... That's, that's certainly the goal that we would love to have trained tomorrow's leaders who have both the leadership and the professional skills, as well as the quantitative STEM skills that you get with an MIT education, all underpinned by a good ethical foundation. That's certainly, I'd be very happy if that's what every student walks away with. Talking about leadership, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your personal leadership philosophy and, and maybe how that has developed over time. Because I, I would imagine your, your leadership philosophy now is quite a bit different than when you first started at ME at MIT when you were 18, 19 years old. It certainly has. And one of the great things about even teaching this class is over the past 20 years from when I first showed up and started teaching it, because we're teaching alongside MIT professors and other people like myself with deep industry experience, I've evolved my own understanding of leadership. And that's been really great. I feel I'm a stronger leader today than I was 20 years. Now, there are all sorts of different models of leadership, and you can read about different ideas in books. There's the Sloan leadership model at MIT's Sloan School of Management. I know other schools, other management schools have their theories of management, but really I think leadership, it is really very simple. And the two definitions I like best that really I think encapsulate it First is a leader is someone who has followers. That's it. That is the most simple definition. If no one is following you, you're not a leader. If you're just doing something by yourself, you're not a leader. It's really that simple. The other quote that I really like, because I often get questions from students, what's the difference between leadership and management? And the line is very fuzzy. And before I give you the quote, I, the second section of my book is on leadership and management, and I end it by saying, well, I look at the differences in the book. We look at just leadership and just management separately. In reality, good leaders manage, good managers lead. You blur the two. So we might look at them separately, but day to day, you're often using them together. But to really understand the subtle difference between the two, there's a fantastic quote, no one has ever managed men into battle. And I imagine as a firefighter, you, you had the same thing. No one managed you into the fire, but someone led the team 
into the fire to take that risk. And even though it doesn't maybe define it, I think it gives a good sense of what it means to lead versus manage. Management kind of, if, if you're a manager, it's more um, position power, I, w- I would say, rather than, you know, maybe somebody on that team that the manager is managing is, you know, one that inspires the rest of the group to really go above and beyond. And you would say maybe they're the informal leader of that group. I I think that inspirational piece is is important, you know? You've hit upon a key point. And for people new to understand leadership, this is very important. It's about that authoritative or positional versus influential leadership. And we often think, well, leader, that's the person in charge. My boss says, do this. And I have to do it. He's the boss. Well, that's not leading, that's commanding, that's directing, that's following a power structure. And that's often how we work. My boss can tell me, here's the goal, make it happen, and I'll do it. But real leading comes from that influence. When someone says, this is what we should do, and not commanding you to do it, but you do it because you've bought into that vision because she is eloquent, she puts forth a good goal, she gets buy-in from other people, you then see her as a leader. And so this is important because junior people, people, I should say, younger, less experienced people often think, well, I will lead when I have this title, when I'm a manager, a director, or a vice president. But you can lead from day one. You can be the person, the most junior person in the room who stands up and says, I have an idea here's what we should do and here's why and you get everyone to buy in so yeah that's a great idea you have in that moment led the team now you might not be managing and executing you might not be the person who says i can decide if the team will put its time towards this that's the manager but when you convince people without commanding them to do something that is leadership how did your experience and the different organizations you've been associated with, how did those experiences influence this philosophy? Would it, would it be more your time teaching at MIT that has had the most influence on you? I think my time teaching helped crystallize it. But my experience through all the different organizations I've been a part of as an employee, as an executive, as a consultant, as an observer in some cases, that's really helped give me that understanding. In fact, one of the earliest lessons I remember, I had a manager, my very first manager uh, in my first job outside of MIT. And he was a fantastic manager. I remember I, I was a junior person. I was given this junior task. And I, one time I did, and I, I screwed it up. I, called me and talked, said, okay, well, here's what you should do to not make that mistake. And a few weeks later, I was in a rush. I cut the corner that I knew I shouldn't have cut. And that was not the right time to cut that corner. The same mistake happened. I thought he said, hey, can you come into my office? I thought, oh, okay, that's it. You know, he told me what to do. I didn't do it. He's going to yell at me. He didn't. He didn't yell. He didn't scream. And he didn't have to. In fact, I think it had more of an impact on me because the fact that he didn't made me really like and respect him. And I did not want to let him down in the future. And so that was one of the first things where I learned you don't have to throw your weight around to get your message across. There are different ways to do that. And so it's a lot of subtle things like that over the years that really helped me understand watching good leaders, watching bad leaders, watching the impact of both really helped, I think, grow and develop my understanding of leadership. I'm curious if, if you'd be willing to share, because in my experience, most leaders with extensive leadership experience have had some profound experiences where they were not successful in being the leader that they really wanted to be. And it really helped shape who they became. 
because of that experience. And I'm wondering if you have any of those that stand out and if so, if you'd be willing to share. Yeah. The question is which of my many mistakes over the years do I share? Because anyone who has been around, they have made many mistakes. The key is have you learned from them? I would say one one kind of theme of some early mistakes I made, because it took me more than one experience to get it, was to recognize that when I was leading a team, it was about some of the interpersonal connections. And the time where it really struck home, I had a team of 35 people. They were direct reports. This was a big problem. You should not have 35 direct reports. Maybe there were about, I had a, a director who had maybe about two or three people under him, but we're talking literally dozens of direct reports. That's a lot of people. And I was juggling a lot of responsibilities. And so one of the challenges was that people weren't feeling connected to me. Now, I said very clearly, a couple of people raised this issue. And my first response was, okay, they said, you know, you're, you're spread too thin. We don't feel in, like you're there for us. I said, okay, help me understand. Was there some meeting I missed? Was there some time I didn't get back to you? I have a policy. I would go to lunch with anyone who asked me. I would, you know, if you need me, I will get to you within 24 hours. Or if you say it's an absolute emergency and you tell me. There weren't cases of, I tried to get you to answer this question and you, you didn't or you weren't around. But it was the fact that I was always in meetings and not just physically around, that people just didn't feel that connection to me. And at the same time, I had someone who came into the company who was gunning for my job. And I was executing very well. We were hitting the metrics. We were blowing the metrics out of the water in terms of what we were producing, what we were delivering operationally. But people didn't feel connected to me. And that was a problem they had to then address of, building that connection. Even though operationally things were going well, longer term, it was important that I built those one-on-one -on -one connections with people in order to be an effective leader of that team. If you had to do that again, how would you manage that situation differently? Rule one, say to companies as they do now, no way am I having that many direct reports. I can have maybe up to about 10. And there's some some research that says you shouldn't even have more than five. I work at startups, money is tight. I'm willing to go above the, the optimal, but once I get above 10 direct reports, no, I really need a different org structure. I do certainly, these days I've learned from that experience that I do want to spend time building and fostering those relationships. Even if they're not, let's talk about business, let's move this forward, but let's just not get to know each other. I do, whenever I join a company, I have a one-on-one -on -one sit down to get to know people, but it just takes time to build a relationship and it's important to invest in building those relationships early on. And so that's what I do now. And that's what I would definitely do differently from that experience. I, I believe that the organization that um, the nonprofit uh playing to million corals. Now, are, are you a scuba diver? I am not, ironically. I would like to be. I do need to learn that. I've done snorkeling. I've seen some coral reefs. The way I got involved with that, I was at a conference where we met the founder of the organization. He is a man named Dr. David Vaughn, who knew how to rapid grow coral. He was retiring from his job. And those of us who met him said, wait a second, you know how to rapid grow coral. We're losing a lot of the ocean's coral population. As the oceans get warmer, the coral is dying off. And coral, they're really the cities of the ocean. A lot of the ocean life is really based around areas with coral, within a few miles of coral. And so if we lose the coral, we're going to lose a lot of ocean population, which of course are going to impact the larger ecosystem and food chain. So saving the coral really, it underpins a lot of, a lot of our ecosystem and even food and food safety long-term. So when we heard he could do this, we said, you, you can't retire, you can leave your job, but you don't have to work on this. 
And he said, well, I know a lot about the science of coral, but I really know nothing about nonprofits and organizations. We said, okay, we'll, we'll take care of that for you. That's what we know how to do. We'll build the infrastructure so you can do what needs to be done to repopulate the world's coral population. And, and so what, what areas of the world is this organization focusing on right now? Right now, we've been primarily focused on the Caribbean. Hopefully, we can go further. We started the organization, I want to say 2019. I think that was a year, but we were really just getting off the ground towards the latter part of 2019, early part of 2020. And unfortunately, we ran into COVID where the industry we partner most with is, of course, the tourism industry, because they have an interest, they have a financial interest in having coral. People come to go diving and see it. So they're interested not just for the ecological benefits, but for the financial tourism benefits. They want to support it. But of course, they were very hard hit during the last two years with COVID. So that definitely, we were running into a headwind and now I think things are opening up again and we hope to accelerate our growth and continue to expand in the Caribbean and outside of it. When you organize events, is it where you're, you're signing up divers to come out on boats and, and go plant coral? We have educational activities. We have coral nurseries. And so these are, think of it like a giant fish tank but in which coral is grown. And so we're working with groups to deploy some of these coral nurseries and then start to grow the coral. So coral, it's actually a very tricky animal. And coral, by the way, it's an animal, not a plant, even though it looks like a plant, it's technically an animal. The issue is how it breeds. It's extremely difficult. And so there are sperm and eggs that get released and they come together and create baby coral. But that baby coral, whereas we as embryos are in a womb, we're in our mother's protected womb, these are just embryos floating around in the ocean. So it can be gobbled up by fish intentionally or accidentally. When they start to fall to the ground, it can be stepped on or scooped up. These are embryos with no protection. So when we create these coral nurseries where there's not going to be anything that's going to kill the embryos, one of the things we can do is yield a bare number of them and you start them out in these protective environments and then transplant them into the ocean. Yeah, and, and that's what I was wondering if part of what you do is organize, because I'm not sure of the name of the organization, but in, in the Florida Keys, they, they go out, they organize events where it's like a three or four day event where divers come they get trained in how to plant the coral and they go out on these boats they dive they get to see some beautiful you know uh, ecosystems and and they're helping to improve that ecosystem so i was wondering if if you your organization plays a role in in those type of events that may very well be us because we are based in the Florida Keys. I don't remember the extent of our implantation programs. Uh, that, that might indeed be us. In your role at MIT and the fact that you're an author and you, and you wrote this book to help people develop, not just the students at, at MIT. So I, I kind of want to talk about steps that we can take, you know, from the beginning and to where you can kind of realize that you're, you're actually effective as a leader. So I, I imagine you're taking, well, actually, first, this question, at what point in the student's uh, educational career or curriculum would they sign up to be a part of the program that you teach in? We do our program at the sophomore year, but that's just, there are various mechanical reasons and constraints why it makes sense for us to do that. Really these skills are skills you want to, I'd say start developing in high school, 
you might even be able to start to address some of the concepts in middle school, certainly address them a little in high school, in college, and really throughout your lifetime. I liken these skills more to learning a sport. Now, this is different from how you normally learn. We think, well, I studied geometry in ninth grade, and a teacher said, here's how many sides are on a triangle, or here's how to calculate angles. And we said, all right, I learned how to do that. Great, I've got that knowledge. And now if you ever show me a shape and I have to calculate the number of angles, I can recall that information and apply it. Right? That's just knowledge transfer. That's recall when I need to know this. It's like knowing how to fill out an expense report. It's very clear when, where, and how to do it. But these skills, they're more like a sport. You'd never say, oh, you're going to be a basketball player. So yeah, in ninth grade, we're going to send you to three weeks of basketball training. We're going to send you to that clinic. They come back. Hey, you're all set. You're done with your basketball playing. You can play the rest of your life. No more training needed. Right? We, of course, never say that. You keep learning and practicing and drilling. And that's true for all of these skills. There's no one and done. Now, unfortunately, that's what we do is we say, oh, we sent you to that two-day leadership seminar. Done, right? You know everything you need to know about being a leader. But it doesn't work that way. So just like as we learn sports, we want to continually practice and develop. We want to do that throughout our career in all of these skills because they're not as simple as I memorized a formula for leadership or I do these three things and I've now communicated effectively. It's subtle and circumstantial. And the more experience you get, the more you learn from other people, from different sources, the better you are going forward. I don't know that you'd be in a position to answer this question, but in your time teaching at MIT, the, the students that have come through that program have you found a, a certain type of student that is more successful in your program than, than not? The ones who are open-minded. And I know that almost sounds like a, a cop-out, but when I think about the spectrum of students, there are some who have come through where you just feel they are natural leaders, naturally good networkers, good communicators. Now, that doesn't mean other people can't be. And again, I'll use the sports analogy. Some people are naturally good at sports. Others aren't. But it doesn't mean if you're not naturally good, you can't become good. In fact, it's usually the people who say, I'm not, but I'm going to work hard. I'm going to train. I'm going to practice every day. They usually overtake the people and say, oh, yeah, I'm just naturally good. I don't have to work as hard. That's so the ones who put in the time and effort who really go further than the ones who just sit back on whatever they have. So the ones who are open about, that, and those could be people who are naturally good at or not or anywhere on the spectrum, but they say, I want to learn and develop versus the people who say, yeah, okay, I get it. I took the class because I heard it's useful and you'll help us get an internship or yeah, I'm good enough at this already. They don't get as much out of it. One of the things I emphasize in the class, and I, I think I mentioned it earlier, we could spend a whole semester on any one of these topics. People do entire PhDs on a tiny subset of the topic. They don't do PhDs on leadership. They do PhDs on a certain type of leadership in a certain circumstance, like transformational leadership in, in Midwestern industrial companies. That's a PhD thesis. That's a tiny, tiny segment. So we could spend a lifetime learning any of these skills and all we can do in our program, which covers a lot of skills in just a year long program, is I say, look, we open the door for you. We help you understand, here's a door, we're opening it up, we're showing you what's on the other side, but you're the one who has to walk through it. You're the one who has to go down that path. And so it's the students who have that motivation to do so. They're the ones who within the program and beyond the program do the best. And that leads me to another question where when, when you're looking at a cross-section of, of graduates of MIT that go out and they've been successful in your program, and then they're successful in whatever field or organization they go to, when you look at them and you see their successes, is there 
some sort of metric that you could almost predict their success, you know, as, as a leader, like, is there something that uh, if they really focus on the, this set of skills, it's going to set them up for success as a leader down the road? It's a great question. In all my years of teaching, there have been three students who really stood out to me as I knew even when they were 19 years old, I said, they're going to go far. One of them created a very well-known multi-billion dollar startup company, a name most of the listeners would recognize. One of them, she just started a, uh, she's been CEO of other companies. She just launched her own. It's a biotech company that started out with $87 million in funding. So I think this is going to be her big success. Third one's on Wall Street. Uh, I know he's had some family issues that have perhaps limited uh, some of his ability to, to grow. He's certainly doing well on Wall Street, but I think he could have gone even further and faster if not for those issues. And when I think back to what was common across all three of them, it's that they had that openness and curiosity. It's that, and by the way, they start out in different places. One of them just, he seemed to show up with all the skills. One of the others, I wouldn't say he had a lot of those skills when I first met him, but all of them had this, I want to learn these skills. I'm gonna put the time and effort into it. I recognize their importance and I recognize it's not just a one and done. I think that's really the hallmark of that trait that separates them from others. So an openness and curiosity and drive to develop. Yes. And, and what do you think is the underlying motivation for that? That's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer. Uh, because different people are motivated different ways. In fact, I even talk about that a little bit in the book, because when you're managing people, you need to understand their motivations. I don't think any of them said it's about money. At no point, even though one of them now is a billionaire, the other success on Wall Street, the other this very well-funded startup company, no one said, I want to make lots of money. I didn't see a single sign of that. I think they all said, I find this interesting the particular space that they chose said, I'm interested in this field and I just want to learn and do. And the challenge of what I'm trying to do here is interesting to them. So I think they were motivated not by money, but by the work itself. I've got certain theories and I, I feel that a lot of the, the most successful people that I've met and, and interviewed and really read about, you'll find that they start off with, it's not really that driven by money or driven by wealth uh, accumulation. They're, they're more driven by what they can add to the world around them. How can they improve life around them? what value can they add to others? It's more selfless. And that, and it seems like that innate desire to, to do that really elevates them. Yeah, I, I agree. And in fact, my friend, Dr. Ruth Gotian, her book just came out about a week or two ago called The Success Factor, in which she interviewed gold medal Olympians, Nobel Prize winners, CEOs, astronauts, people who really are at the very top of their fields, not a single one of them was motivated by money. And in fact, what you find is that the one who actually gets it, they don't say, okay, well, I'm, I'm done. I'm resting on my laurels. In fact, she mentioned most of the Olympians she mentioned, they don't have their medals even out. Their medals are sitting in a closet somewhere. Their medals are sitting in a drawer. They're not, here it is, probably look at what I did and this is who I am. They felt, hey, I did this, that's great. Now what's next? The Nobel Prize winners, 
and Nobel Prize, that's that's a lifetime. You don't get that in your 20s or 30s. You typically get in your 50s or 60s. They don't say, okay, now I've made it. They say, hey, fantastic. They're excited, obviously. But then they just go back to work and do more. So the people I think who are really successful are the ones who love what they do, either because the nature of the work is fun or the impact it has on society, on the field, that's what drives them. And so I agree with your, your theory. It really is about that type of motivation more than money or fame or titles or any kind of external acknowledgement. Steve, when, when I think about the, the leadership program in the department that I, I work for, when I think about you know, the initial focus of you know, the new firefighters coming in and really trying to teach them that they are leaders right now. And it's how you conduct yourself. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a firefighter. When people see you in the, in the uniform, you're a firefighter. And if you say, we need to go out this door right now, they'll do it. They're going to welcome you into their home to help their ailing relative or whatever. It's, there's a responsibility there that comes with being a leader. And it's selfless. Now, how you develop that mindset in young people is really, I, I, I'm, I'm asking if you have any ideas on how you can instill that mindset in young young people before they graduate high school and go to college because if you talk to a lot of high school kids nowadays it's they're they're thinking money like what can i do to make the most money it's it's very materialistic and i don't know if it's just because their brains haven't developed completely and they're living in a material world or, or what but if if you had this opportunity to, to go and teach high school students and you know, really uh, affect them in a way that could motivate them to have this mindset of selflessness, can you think of a way that, that you would approach that? That's a really good question. You're going to get an off-the-cuff answer. I'm going to have to reflect on this a lot more after the show, but here's my, my first take. We all start out selfish. When we're two years old, it's all about me, me, me. I want the food. I don't want to go to bed. Like we've all seen that in two-year-olds. We've all been that two-year-old. And that's fine when you're a two-year-old. In fact, that's when you first develop that sense of self, that sense of control. You learn the word no. <laughs> you know, Mom says, do this. When you're one, you do it. But at two, you can say, I have agency, I have choice. And you focus on what you want more than anything else. As kids develop, they start to learn it's not just about them. Now, how well they develop it, how quickly, at what age, that varies. And we see that with the kid who has two scoops of ice cream and their friend loses their scoop of ice cream. Do they say, I'm going to give you a scoop of ice cream, right? I'll give you one of mine. Or do you say, nope, too bad. This is mine. I don't care about your needs. Right? Very, very kind of trivial example. And so I think it begins by recognizing the needs of yourself versus the needs of other. And if you are just looking at yourself, well, then it's not about leading. It's just about, I do what I want for me. You're literally not leading. We talked about the definition of leadership is having followers. But why would you follow me? Because we have some joint goal, whether that's putting out the fire, whether that's changing the world, whether that's trying to grow the business, it's a joint goal. But if all I care about are my needs, you're probably, you're not buying into my needs very much. So as individuals self-focused, we don't really think about leadership. Once I think about needs other than my own, your needs, our needs together, 
the group's needs, the community's needs, society's needs, that's when we start to lead. That's when I start to say, here's something that someone other than just myself is interested in. And if I want to see this happen, no one else seems to be getting it done. You start to say, should I step up and do it? And how do I, how do I get you to do it? I don't want to do most of the work. I want to get you to do the work. But then I have to lead you to do the work. And so I think it's as we start to go from that focus just on ourself as we do it too, to the focus on the needs of others. And that's what first starts to motivate the development of leadership. So that's probably how I would think to approach it when developing young students. But I'm definitely gonna have to think a lot more about this question because I think it's a really good one and I should have a much better answer for it. I, I think that how you approach that is it's more thought out than I, I, I didn't go back that far <laughs> in my mind. You know, I'm just really, I was really thinking about, you know, the high school students that are getting ready to graduate. And some of them are thinking, you know, I want to go play ball at college and get picked up and be a professional athlete so I can make millions of dollars or they're looking at career fields that, you know, there are some pretty savvy high school students that are like picking their career path based on the, you know, the saturation of employees in that field and, and what, um, what the, starting annual income is but there has to be more than that and i i feel like we kind of touched on that that those those three individuals that that cross paths with you i would bet that they had this kind of on lockdown in high school you know i mean would you agree with that? I, I think they certainly had a larger sense than just themselves and their own needs. But while we certainly do see some high school students who just say, hey, how do I make money? Or what's in it for me? What maximizes my happiness, whether it's money or something else? There's also a great number of students who really do care about other causes and issues. A friend of mine runs an organization called Do Something, dosomething.org. And that takes high school students who say, I want to do something. They have some cause they care about, some nonprofit cause. And they're not exactly sure, or maybe at age 14, 15, 16, how to do it. Do Something provides a lot of support to them. And I've seen hundreds of these students, and I'm sure there are thousands, maybe even tens of thousands. I've just seen a small number who really care about doing something, about making some impact. They're not thinking about, hey, how do I get more money? How do I spend more time at the mall or playing video games or online? How do I help someone or something other than myself? So we do see this in some people. And it just goes to how quickly and how well and at what age it's developed in different people. .org. And is that national? It's headquartered in New York, but I do believe it's national. And so if anyone listening is in high school or has a student who's in high school, you can refer them to do something.org and take a look and see if that's something that can help them in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the first time that I've heard of that. Um, and so the reason that I was asking this question is because I've found myself really wanting to go and, and speak at, at high schools. Part of it is that my daughter's in high school now, and I'd like to have some, or a greater impact on her than I have right now, because man, she is in a lot of activities after school. And, um, and, and I see some amazing talents, not just in her, but in a lot of her friends. And I, I wonder when they go on to college, what is the mindset that they're entering college with? And 
And so when I go and I speak at schools, I kind of want to speak to that and uh, having a sense of obligation to those around us. You know, it's not just about us. It's about those around us. How can we impact their lives? How can we make those around us, how can we make their lives better? Yeah, that is that is certainly a noble goal. And I'm fully bought into your philosophy because if we can do that, if we can instill that in the next generation, I think society as a whole will be much better when we move from just that focus on self to that focus on us as a community. And so there are, I'm sure, a lot of organizations, I'm trying to think now, where would I start to look? Uh, I might even start with just local, a Kiwanis club, a Rotary club, see what types of programs they have, because I know they do a lot of support for students. There are great organizations here in New York City, we have a great one called Pencil, in which people do after school tutoring for different students. There's also another great one called the Pajama Program that helps kids who are underprivileged get books and encourage reading. Because of course, starting out learning to read is how we encourage students to learn, to open up their mind, to expand beyond just what they know. And that's both literally what they know that different countries, different ideas, but also moving beyond just the self and what they can see and touch and these ideas that are bigger than them. But I'm sure there are wonderful versions of these programs all over the country. Now, I, I want to get back to your book because, you know, a lot of the interviews that I do, you know, we focus on leadership and personal development, self-leadership, the importance of good self-leadership when you're a leader. <laughs> but I... Um, I'd like to dig in a little bit on your book and how that can help the listeners achieve more than, well, what they're currently achieving. <laughs> well, let me give an example of why you should emphasize these skills. Now, I'm going to talk about negotiating for a little bit, and then we'll get back to leadership. I use negotiating because it's easier to do the math, as you'll see. Imagine you're 25 years old. And so you learn to negotiate. Maybe you read my book, you read a different book on negotiating, you take an online class, however you want to do it, you start to learn to negotiate. Now, we're not talking about being a master negotiator. We're not talking about world-class negotiations. We're talking about being just a little bit better than where you are today. Then you go out, you're 25 years old, and you have a job offer for $50,000. But instead of taking the job as is, you negotiate that job. Say, hey, before I accept, let me talk to you about why I should get a little more and what we can do to make that happen. And so you get $1,000 more. You get $51,000. That's not a huge bump. We can imagine that happening. So you spend five, 10 minutes negotiating, and you got... 51,000. If you do nothing else, if you stay in this very job for the next 40 years, you've just in 10 minutes earned $1,000 more for 40 years. In 10 minutes, you just got $40,000. That's amazing. When you think of it that way, why have you not learned to negotiate sooner? Now, of course, many people are saying, hey, wait a second, I can't stay in a job for 40 years. And that's right, you're gonna take other jobs. You're gonna get promotions and raises. You'll negotiate those too. And you're going to negotiate for more than just $1,000. So if you learn to negotiate, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your earning. Of course, we're just talking about salary negotiations at the moment. In fact, if you become a better negotiator, not only might you negotiate salary, or maybe you're in a job, union jobs, of course, you don't always negotiate your salary, the union does that. But we negotiate all the time, not just with external people like customers, we negotiate with coworkers. You probably negotiate when you have people who 
say, you know, I don't want to leave the burning building. I have to go save my precious whatever saying, look, that's not a good thing you should do. How do you convince them? You might only have seconds to do so. How do you convince them it's not worth taking that risk? How do you convince your coworker? Look, I know you don't want to go down this path and I'm asking you to do a lot of work, but here's what I'll do for you. I'm going to help you on this other project. We negotiate all the time. So learning to negotiate, it's going to be adding a lot of money to your bottom line, and it's going to make you much more effective at work. So here's the secret. I use negotiation because we can do the math. We can say $1,000, 40 years, here's how it works out. If you get better at leadership, at communicating, at networking, at any of these other skills, and we're not talking about being the best person out there. We're not talking about leading a team of 100,000 people to change the world. We're talking about getting just a little bit better at leading or any of these other skills. You're going to have the same impact. Now, no one's going to say, oh, you're a better leader. Here's $1,000 more for this job. But you will be brought into more projects. You will have more impact. You will be seen as a leader. You will get the jobs instead of other people. And that's going to advance your career. It's going to help you financially. And it's going to help you be more successful and have more impact. So all of us, wherever we are in our careers, need to focus, even if it's just getting a little bit better, the returns you get throughout your career are amazing. Now, who's the ideal reader for your book? Like, what, what age range would you say? Well, well, what's the earliest age that you would say is somebody in their late teens would, would get it? I'd say late teens, we do see it's a popular graduation gift for high school seniors. I think getting a little below that into freshman or sophomore, it might be a little bit of a stretch. They can get the ideas. And if your student really wants to learn this, great, but it can be a little hard. They don't always have the context for all of these skills. High school seniors, college students, really the sweet spot is 20s and 30s. But I've had people in their 40s, 50s, even 60s say, this has been so helpful. I wish I knew this 30 years ago. But it, we've impacted people of, of all ages. But really, I think, especially in your 20s and 30s is when you've got the most impact because you still have a lot of longevity. But wherever you are in your career, we did that analysis. If you're 25,000 hours more, well, if you're 45, you might only have 20 years yet. But hey, that's still 20,000 hours more. So it still works. It's just how, for how long you'll get that extra impact. What is the best way to connect with you and the, and the best way to, to pick up your book? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. And there you can see where to buy it. Amazon, of course, and other places. You can reach out to me on the contact page or follow me on social media. If you want more content, we've got a weekly blog. There's the free app that you mentioned. And so that app from the website is gonna take you to the Android and iPhone store where you can download that free app. And then there's a resources page where I list other great books. If you wanna go further on some of these topics, I link to other free resources online and I have a bunch of free downloads. So all of this is available at thecareertoolkitbook.com. Well, I will have those links. Um, at the bottom of the show notes page. So um, all the listeners, you know the, the drill. Um, if you want to connect with Mark, I, I would say at the very least, check out his website, check him out on social media, check out the app. Because I think being able to look at the app is just a, a little bit of insight about what is in that book and the value that the book brings. So, um, you know, if you're not sold on the book yet, take a look at that app and you will be. So, uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on today and, and allowing me to interview you and ask you all these questions and um, just really sharing your story with us. So thank you. Thank you for having me on the show and thank you to your listeners for giving us their time. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. 
My goal is, and always will be, to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts, linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.